What's going on, everybody? This is the Tom Rowland Podcast brought to you by Starbright. You know, we are on number 881. When I say that, I can't even believe it because I started this podcast as just like a little a little side project, just a hobby. I thought podcasting was cool. I thought, man, there's some people out there that I would like to talk to, and there's some cer- certainly some people out there that I would like to get their stories and have them talk to me in a in a situation to where we're not looking at our phones, we're just sitting down having a conversation. Those times in today's world are few and far between. And this podcast has allowed me to sit down with some of the most interesting people in fishing, some of my heroes, some of my mentors, and some people, honestly, that I never thought I was gonna get time with. We did a Ask Me Anything podcast a few weeks ago. And in that, I put out on the text line which is area code 305-930-7346. You can always ask me any kind of questions that you want there. And a lot of people text in, had a number of questions about which have been my favorite episodes. And I don't really have a favorite episode because I have enjoyed all of them. But I do have some that stand out as some of the most memorable ones. Some of the ones that gave me the most insight into a person and some of the ones that were maybe more memorable than others. And one of them is the one we're gonna go over today. So what I thought we would do over the next couple of weeks is a series of these podcasts that have either been some of the most memorable ones or some of the most impactful to me, some of the ones that I received the most feedback on, both positive and negative, because not all of them have been popular, (laughs) by the way. But I thought in the next couple of weeks we would just kind of bring back some of the ones that are the most memorable or maybe the ones that maybe fell through the cracks. We have a lot of new listeners on the podcast and maybe going back from number 881 back to number 50, maybe maybe you haven't had the opportunity to do that. So I'm going to kind of curate these for you. These are some of my favorite ones and we're going to start today with a trip that I made over to Collierville, Tennessee. Collierville, Tennessee is also the home of Bill Dance. Bill Dance, if, if you know fishing, you know Bill Dance. He is the person that's been on TV the longest. He's everybody's favorite fisherman, and uh, what an honor it was. I called him up to ask him to do this podcast, and he agreed. No problem. We sat down in his studio, right where you see him film all his shows, and I was able to really talk to Bill in a way that I don't get to talk to him at sports shows or any other place that I, that I happen to run into to Bill. We were able to sit down and I was able to get his story from start to finish, how he started and what it takes to be the legendary angler Bill Dance. And I will tell you this before we get into this podcast, that it didn't happen by accident. It didn't happen by accident at all. Bill Dance is a product of hard work and determination, and you're going to find out exactly hard, how hard he had to work to get to where he is today. So it's a real pleasure to bring back this episode with none other than the legendary Bill Dance. I hope you enjoy it. I'm sitting down here with Bill Dance, the legend Woo! of all time. And I uh, just want to say it's a real honor to, to sit down. I want to appreciate I want to thank you for uh, spending a little time with me. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Tom. Well, thank you. So I'm going to read something right now, and I want to get your reaction to it. All right. 2,000 episodes, 36 videos, 12 educational tapes, four blooper videos, seven books, IGFA Hall of Fame, thousands of newspaper articles, 23 national bass titles, eight-time qualifier for the Bassmaster Classic out of nine times, three times Bass Angler of the Year. You won seven of the first 17 events you ever entered, and you're also credited for catching the first bass in BASS history. I did all that. (laughs) I don't know, did you? It says Who it told you website. all that? <laughs> it says it on your website. And so what I'm wondering I was is, lucky, wasn't I? Yeah, I get, well, I don't know. I don't think you can be quite that lucky. Uh, if somebody had told you that you were going to do all that, Woo. would you have believed them? No. You know, I just I came along at the right time, and I was blessed that I had a daddy and a granddaddy that uh, taught me a lot about this great sport. And uh, 
you know, I credit my granddaddy. My daddy, my daddy was uh, more of a, he was a doctor, my granddaddy doctor. They, my, my father was uh, more of a hunter. Mm-hmm. He shot a lot of skeet and trap, and he fished a lot, but nothing like he He hunted more than he uh, fished, but my grandfather was more of a fisherman. Yeah. And uh, I learned a lot about fishing from my grand, grandfather, but I learned a lot about uh, anatomy. He taught me about the importance of sight. He taught me a lot about the importance of hearing and uh, the anatomy of a fish, which mm-hmm. helped me a lot uh, through my career. Now, where was this? Did you grow up in Memphis? Well, I spent. I, I was born in Memphis, mm-hmm. and I spent a lot of time in Memphis, but I spent a lot of time in Middle Tennessee in Moore County, uh, Lynchburg. Okay. Uh, that's the home of Jack Daniels, right. a dry county, but... <laughs> I spent a lot of time in Lynchburg on Mulberry Creek, and uh, I love moving water, mm-hmm. and I still do today. I love to fish moving water. Yeah. And uh, I grew up fishing uh, that type of fishing. Of course, I fished ponds and things as I, uh, whenever I could, but living in Memphis, I was kind of limited uh, until I got a little bit older Yeah. where I could get a car or I rode the city bus uh, with worms in my pocket. And real fi- worms? And, and, yeah, yeah, real worms. <laughs> yeah, um, before plastic Yeah, worms, I'd wrap probably. them up in a bag or something, in a can, and I'd ride the city bus to uh, local uh, city parks that had a lake. Mm-hmm. And But I always loved to go to, to Lynchburg. And then I'd, the creek, my grandmother could walk out on her front porch and holler, Billy! She's called me <laughs> Billy when I was little. And uh, or she'd take a pan and beat it with a spoon, and yeah. I could hear it because it within it was in distance, hearing distance of the front porch, and yeah. uh, and I'd run back to the house. That's how close the creek was. Yeah. So I'd fish up and down the creek. But what kind of fish would you catch in that little creek? It, well, we had uh, when the creek got muddy, I'd fish for catfish. Mm-hmm. It was some kind of a theory, you know, when the creek got muddy, that's the time to catch catfish. But um, it uh, it had. We called them black perch, mm-hmm. but it was, but they ran big back then. It was a rock bass, red eyed, right. and we had small mouth, mm-hmm. and we had large mouth, mm-hmm. and we had hog nose sucker. We had uh, beautiful sunfish, just uh, just big, beautiful sunfish. Yeah. So we had a, a mix of fish in the creek, but the small mouth and the large mouth and the that uh, red eye, black perch. what we called a red eye when right. I grew up, that was one of my favorite fish to fish for. And we, I fished with my dad. We fished um, a lot in the in the ponds and and lakes, but we also fished in the moving water, and that's what I preferred. Oh, and, I love and moving that, water. I think that that really um, kind of helped me to get to my trout fishing background was because. I had a background of fishing in these muddy muddy creeks for those rock bass and stuff like that. But later, then I'm fishing in the clear water, and and that was man, it was close to my heart. I really love that. Um, so you wouldn't have believed it if somebody had told you that you would have you would have had a career in fishing when you were a kid. Well, you know, I always wanted it. That's a career I always wanted. Yeah. I, I, I somehow I, I wanted to uh, get into that industry. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I talked to. Well, wait, wait a minute. Was there even an industry? At this time? Well, yeah, there was an industry, you know. Uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about what year? Well, now, when I was young like that, no, I didn't even know about an industry. But uh, but as I got older, I, uh, the, it, there was an industry, mm-hmm. you know. Like somebody, fishing, somebody television sold, shows? Somebody sold fishing lures. Okay. And somebody made fishing lures. Mm-hmm. And somebody made rods and somebody made reels. Right. And uh, I, I dreamed of that. Uh, I'd like to kind of do that. And... You know, it would come and go, mm-hmm. and I'd see these lures and magazines. There was a field and stream. There was a sports field, mm-hmm. and there was a guy by the name of Jason Lucas, mm. and I'd read his articles, and uh, I'd, I'd think about, boy, how, how did they make those lures? I said, boy, that'd be a neat thing to do. And then as time passed, you know, and I got older and older, and then I, I started to think, boy, I'd like to do that someday. And I may be jumping the jumping the gun here. But as time passed, I was fortunate enough to play on all four corners. Not only did I get the opportunity to be a manufacturer, mm. to work for a manufacturer, to sell for a manufacturer, to promote for a manufacturer, mm. I got to do all of those things. And Within a span I, I of how a, long? I turned a hobby into a profession. 
Pardon? How, when you – all four of those corners, within a span of how many years did you – Oh, it was – well, it's when uh, – we're jumping now mm -hmm. uh, th through uh, many years. But uh, I got uh, I got an opportunity to uh, – as a result of the fishing tournaments of doing exceptionally well, mm -hmm. uh, the first three tournaments, I placed second. I was a bridesmaid, boom, 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 in the mm -hmm. first three tournaments. And the next year, boom, 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 I won the next three. Okay. And then the following two weeks after I won the next three, I had three major lure companies contact me. I had Jim Bagley, mm -hmm. who made the balsa baits in Winter Haven, Florida, call me. Mm -hmm. I had Nick Cream, the inventor of the plastic worms, contact me. And I had Head and Lure Company. And Dewaljic, Michigan, the, the old one of the oldest lure companies mm -hmm. called me, which I just was absolutely eaten up. They made the Lucky Thirteen mm -hmm. and all the great baits, the old timey baits. Yeah. And I thought, golly, Head and Lure Company calling me. The, Nick Cream, the inventor of the plastic worm, calling me. Mm -hmm. And then Jim Bagley, you know, the inventor of the balsa baits, and I couldn't believe it. And they all wanted to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And the thing that kind of impressed me, Ken White, the national sales manager for Cream Lure Company, calling me and saying, uh, Mr. Cream and Miss Cream, Nick and Cosma Cream, would like for you and your wife to fly to Tyler, Texas, all mm -hmm. expenses paid, and uh, spend the weekend with them. And that kind of impressed me. Yeah. And 50% of the fish I was catching at that time were on plastic worms. Right. And so Diane and I packed up, went to the Memphis airport, and flew to Shreveport. Mm -hmm. And Ken White picked us up, and we drove, or he drove us down to Tyler. <laughs> and we stayed with uh, Nick and Cosma, and Diane fell in love with Cosma. She was just the sweetest little lady. Yeah. And we stayed at their home, and Nick said, Bill, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to furnish you a vehicle. I'd like to double your salary, hmm. and I'm saying, it, who, it, who is he talking to? <laughs> and he was a wonderful, sweet man. I would like for you to fish, to hire you to fish with national uh, distributors and show them how to fish our products uh -huh. and do national promotions. And I said, Thank you. <laughs> I said, my dream. That's Done my deal. dream. I'd right. love to do that. And uh, I went to work for Nick. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just now, a dream now, come now true. Now, just tell me, just just paint the picture of this. Of, of What year is this? This was in the late 60s. Okay, so late 60s. Or, it are ran, there, like, late 69, 70, right in there. Are day. there, first of all, is BASS, does it exist yet? Oh yeah, because because okay. I had one, I, I had, I had three seconds and then three first. Okay. But in the BASS tournaments, right? Okay, so are there other people that are making a, a living no. doing fishing at all, no, or, no. Or, or does it a sponsorship like this? Had you ever heard of anyone doing something like this? Well, at that time, I had co contacted Strand, mm -hmm. uh, the fishing line people, yeah, and uh, a guy by the name of McCarran, and. Uh, I said, I'd like to be a field tester. And he said, what's a field tester? <laughs> you knew that from Lynchburg. Yeah. That used to be the cap they had, field, the whiskey field yeah, tester. Yeah, the field. And I said, I want to be a, a field promotional tester. And I could get free fishing line. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, well, I don't know what that is, but uh, if that's what you want to be, consider yourself a, be our first field tester. Okay. And uh, – so I became a field tester, and he said, I've never heard of a field tester. I don't know what they are, but uh, if that's what you want to be, a field tester, you're our field tester. And I said, okay. So I, that kind of kick-started that. And then, you know, starting to work for, for Nick, because there wasn't any competition there because Nick didn't make fishing line. Mm -hmm. And uh, – I did that for a couple of years, traveling, mm -hmm. uh, all expenses paid, could go fishing wherever I wanted to. I could take buyers, 
uh, from big discount. The big discount chains weren't really that big. They were growing at that time. Right. The only place you could really buy tackle back in those early days was hardware stores. <laughs> yeah. But but the discount chains were starting to jump up. Uh, Globe, hmm. uh, Woolco. Uh, you probably don't remember. Woolworths. I remember Woolworths yeah, yeah, well, used to sell tackle. And then Woolco came behind that. And then uh, Oshman, the mm-hmm. big Oshman yeah, yeah. change down through yeah. Texas. Well, I was taking the buyers fishing and showing them how to fish. And Nick came with a uh, a slip sinker pack. It consisted of a little, a half a dozen slip sinkers, mm-hmm. uh, six or eight war- uh, uh, hooks. Right. And we used a sprout hook then, and mm-hmm. we talked about why that sprout hook was so important. It had a wide gap and the importance of that. And we put six shimmy gal worms in there. That was the worm. Mm-hmm. It was a seven-inch worm. And we sold so many of those doggone worms, that the shimmy gal pack. Then we came with the shimmy gal six-inch. We had the shimmy gal seven-and-a-quarter-inch. Then we came with the big ten-inch, yeah. the monster pack. And we went everywhere. We'd have promotions, and we'd sell that worm. But anyway. So you're selling all of these worms through just personal appearances and? At, at these stores, at the yeah. Oshman chain, at the Woolco chain, right. at the wh- wherever. So this is still going hand in hand with working with Cream? Yeah, I was working with Cream. Right. And I, I'd go to Toledo Bend, mm-hmm. and I would invite these buyers in and writers in mm-hmm. from Shreveport, uh, from Tyler, Texas, from the Houston uh, big, big name writers, and they would come in, and I'd fish them for a couple of days and show them how to rig the bait and how mm-hmm. to fish the bait. Mm-hmm. And I'd go down and uh, check in, and I'd stay down there for a week or two. Mm-hmm. And I'd have the these noted writers come in. Right. Uh, like I said, be a writer from uh, uh, Reeves from the Shreveport Times. Uh, I can't even remember all the writers. And there'd be a big writer from Houston Post would come in. And it'd be a writer from the Dallas Times, would uh, Dallas uh, Morning News would come in, mm-hmm. and I'd have them all programmed. Hmm. You know, I'd have him Monday, and I'd have him Tuesday, and I'd have him Wednesday, and I'd have him Thursday. And they'd meet me, or I'd meet them at a certain location, the trading post in Hemp Hill, Texas. Uh-huh. And we'd fish to lead them in. And then it, maybe it'd be, I'd be on Smith Lake. Uh, and I'd have a meet me at Jasper at the Holiday Inn, and then they'd be in Ross Barnett. I'd meet them at the Holiday Inn in Jackson, Mississippi, mm-hmm. and I, I'd fish with a lot of writers, yeah, and talking about the bait and how to fish the bait. And it, it, this was kind of a dream come true. I was fishing a lot, and I was fishing with the people, and I was showing them and educating them on right. how to fish a slip sinker worm and, and how to worm fish. And pretty much no one else was doing anything no, no like one this. was doing it back in those days, right? And uh, then I continued to fish the tournaments, and thank the good Lord I was doing well in the tournaments, mm-hmm. and I was getting a lot of publicity from these writers that I was entertaining, and Cream was getting a lot of publicity, and I did that, uh, Tom, for a couple of years, and then one day I got the idea. I said, you know, if I can do this for Tom, I mean, for, for Nick— I ought to be able to do it for myself. Hmm. So I went and sat down with Nick. And I said, Nick, and he, he kind of laughed, and he said, he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, I knew this day would come. <laughs> and he said, I said, you know, I want to try this. I want to do this on my own. Mm-hmm. And he said, you see that door right there? And I went, oh, goodness. <laughs> and he said, he, he said, that door swings both ways. He said, you go try it, and if it doesn't work out, you come back. Uh-huh. And he got up, and he hugged my neck, and I took off. And a, a good buddy of mine, Charles Spence, mm-hmm. that's when Charles and I started basically Strike King Lure Company in that, that span of time. And uh, that writers were still contacting me and wanting me to go fishing and we were trying to start up the lure company, and and Charles was always wanting to go on these rider trips, mm-hmm. and the riders would say, "Well, Charles, we don't need you to go on the trip. We need I, I need Bill." And I could see Charles's feelings <laughs> it was hurting Charles's feelings, yeah. and, and I felt horrible about it. And uh, 
and I was leaving Charles there to do all the work, and here I'm out fishing, and here I'm going to the tournaments, and I could see this wasn't going to work. Mm-hmm. And finally, I just said, look, Charles, you take the company and you run with it, and I was just going to continue fishing the tournaments, and I was going to do something else because mm-hmm. it just it wasn't working out. And I could see some animosity there, and and I didn't want to destroy a friendship between right. Charlie and I. And I, so I had a conversation with Cotton Cordell over in Little Rock, and Cotton said, "Well, I tell you what, your fishing's really cut in half now that you're in the lure business." And I said, "No, I'm not in the lure business." He said, "What are you doing?" And I said, uh, "Well, I'm just fishing with some riders and looking around." Mm-hmm. And he said. Why don't you look around over here in Hot Springs Monday morning? <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, I want to talk to you. So I drove to Hot Springs that next Monday, and Cotton said, i tell you what I want to do. I want to give you a vehicle. <laughs> I want to double your salary. <laughs> kind of like what Nick said. Yeah. And I didn't kind of want to go back to Nick because uh, there were some personal reasons. Uh, and... Uh, Nick was kind of thinking about Vaden and his mm-hmm. children were kind of moving up. And so I I didn't go back to Nick. And I went to work for Cotton. Mm-hmm. And Cotton had offered me double the salary in a vehicle. And I kind of started doing the same thing for Cotton. And Cotton came to me and he said, look, after about uh, a year, he said, doing the same thing. He said, we need a television show. Hmm. And I said, okay, I think that's good. I've got the perfect guy to do it. So this is 1968? And now this was around that same time, 70, around okay. 70. He said, uh, you got the perfect guy for us to do it? And I said, I sure do. And this guy, we were rooming together, fishing the tournaments together. And he was, I wouldn't be doing TV today if it wasn't for this guy. Huh. And he said, who's that? And I said, Jerry McKinnis. No kidding. And he said, McKinnis? And I said, yep. Yeah. Jerry and I have been traveling together. I've been helping Jerry shoot stuff, and Jerry's taught me a lot about uh, television. And and Jerry is your man. And he says, well, I've got a different idea. <laughs> and I said, Why? what's that, Cotton? And I love Cotton. Cotton Cordell made the hot spot and uh-huh. the red fin and a lot of great baits. And I loved him like a daddy. He said, no, um, I've got a better guy. And I said, okay, who's that? And he said, you. Huh. And I said, me? <laughs> I said, God, me on TV is like pouring perfume on a pig. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I, I can't even spell television. I said, I can't, man, you've got to be crazy. He said, no, nope, I want you to do it. And I said, Cotton, I, I can't do a TV show. I don't know anything. He said, yep, Jerry's taught you a lot about it. And so I told Jerry, I said, Cotton wants me to do a TV show, Jerry. He says, do it. Hmm. You can do it. Now, did Jerry already have his show going Yeah, all? Jerry had a show going, okay. too. And and uh, I said, you think I can do it? And Jerry said, yeah, you sure you can do it. So Cotton bought me a camera, just like the one I'd been shooting a little bit with a Scoopic, mm-hmm. Canon Scoopic. It's very simple. And... uh so I went to a local TV station, and I knew the editor, and he showed me how to edit. And linear uh, editing back then. Uh, huh? like linear editing. Yeah. Like you're cutting and yeah, It was cutting and pasting and all. Yeah. And he showed me basically how to do it. So I went to our CBS affiliate, and I went to the program director. And I said, I'd like to do a local fishing show for your network, your, 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 st- your local station. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, I just don't think. Uh, I said, I said, well, you did get about Gaddis, sponsored by Liberty Mutual, mm-hmm. and he said, yeah, but uh, we we just don't think there's a market for a local show. And I went, and I got, I got really discouraged. Then I went to Al Michaels at the NBC affiliate, and I walked in, and big old tall guy, and big had a. I walked in his office and. Little big burl walnut desk sitting there, and he got up. Can I help you? And I said, Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Brooks Brothers suit, uh-huh. about a four hundred dollar tie on, and I, I said, um, I had a pair of blue jeans. And I didn't look too appealing, but I said, uh, 
Mr. Grady, I'd like to talk to you about the possibility of doing a local fishing show. A what? And I said, a local fishing show. A what is that? And I said, <laughs> and I told him my format and how I wanted to do it. And he said, no, uh -uh, I don't think that's something. But would, no, we're not interested in anything like that. And I said, well, wait a minute, let me tell you what. I think it created a lot of local appeal. And uh, so I went home and I was really discouraged. Yeah. And I said, this this ain't going to work. This, I, I can't do this. And Diane said, what did I tell you about can't? And I said, what? She said, what did I tell you about the word can't? And I said, she said, I've told you that word, get it out of your vocabulary. And she always said, and I said, well, three doesn't want it, five doesn't want it. And she said, isn't ABC sports-minded? I said, yeah, I think. She said, they're always talking about sports entertainment on ABC. Why don't you go to ABC? I said, they probably don't want what did I say? <laughs> I said, <laughs> she's not five feet tall, but she's, I mean, dynamite uh -huh. comes in small packages. Yes, she's heard that expression. I said, I'll go see him in the morning. She said, what about this afternoon? I will. I'll, let me go in the morning. So I went over there, and I got over there about 11. I remember mean, it was a little bit after 11, and the switchboard operator, I'll never forget her. Her name was Elizabeth. And I saw it on her little name. I walked up, and I said, Elizabeth? She said, yes, that's me. <laughs> I said, who is your program director? She said, Lance Russell. And I said, is he in? She said, no, he went to lunch, but he'll be back by two if you'd like to come back. And I said, no, ma'am, I'll just wait. And she said, well, it's just a little bit after 11. That's, that'll be a pretty good wait. I said, that's fine. I'll wait. But I want to be here when he comes back. She says, well, okay. And so I just went over there and sat down. Uh -huh. And a little bit later, she said, would you like something to drink? And uh, I said, no, ma'am, I'm fine. So she said, well, I'm going to get me a Coca-Cola. If you want one, I'll get you one. And I said, no, ma'am. She said, well, I'm getting you one. <laughs> so she and I became good buddies. So she went and got one, got me one. And she said, uh, what do you do? And I said, well, I told her. And then she told me she liked to fish. And we kept, struck up a conversation. And uh, about 10 minutes of one, she walked over and she said, guess what? Mr. Russell came up the back fire escape, mm -hmm. uh, back steps, and he's here, and uh, he's ready to see you. I said, well, great. And she said, uh, just go right on up the steps. Now, I'll never forget that green carpet, and I bounced up those steps, and I went down the hall, and there was a lady standing there, and she said, there's his office. Hmm. And I walked in, and he stood up, and his hands, he had his hands like that. He walked around the end of his desk, and he stuck his hand out, and he said, Bill Dance. And I said, Mr. Russell. He said, call me Lance. Have a seat, Bill. And he said, better that. And he took his chair, and he pulled his chair up, pulled my chair up close to his desk. He said, sit down. What can I help you with? And I said, I want to do a local fishing show, and I want to do it here on Channel 13. And he said, you may not remember this, you know WBBJ? And I said, in Jackson, Tennessee, Channel 7. He said, that's right. I said, I've done a few shows there with Tony Laws. He said, yeah, Tony Laws did a local show there. He said, well, I used to do a local show there. Hmm. And I said, you did? And he said, yeah, I was program director there before I came here. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, tell me what you've got in mind. And I said, I'd like to do a local show. And I explained how I wanted to do it, how I had it formatted. And he says, okay. He said, I like the idea. When would you like to air it? And I said, Friday nights. Thursday night or Friday night mm -hmm. for the weekend. Yep. He said, well, let me tell you what we need. We need two things. We need a pilot. I said, I don't even have a plane. <laughs> he said, <laughs> we said, no. He said, you got a lot to learn. And, yeah. he said, and then he started laughing. He said, a pilot, we need a show. And I said, okay. And I said, I can get that. And he said, well, we need a sponsor. And here it is, uh, just a little bit after 1 o'clock. Uh -huh. And I said, okay, to sponsor the event. I said, all righty. 
I said, I can get the show, and let me see about the sponsor. He said, you work on that, and I'll see what I can do. Mm -hmm. And I said, thank you. And he said, let's talk later in the week. And I said, fine. And he said, if you come up with something, you let me know immediately, and I will. And I shook his hand. I went out the door, got in my truck, and I went straight down to 2526 Elvis Presley Boulevard. And I walked in a building called Fabulous Surplus City. And I walked up to a guy named Billy Woods. I said, Billy, I got a chance to put a local fishing show on Channel 13 to air Thursday night or Friday night. And I'm telling you, I can sell you lots and lots of fishing tackle. I'll promise you. And Mm -hmm. he said, I know you can. And I said, would you be interested? Would you entertain the thought of sponsoring that? He said, absolutely. I said, what are you doing the next hour? He said, nothing. I said, will you ride with me out to Channel 13 and talk to Lance Russell? He said, I sure will. I said, come on. He got in my truck, and we drove out there, and I walked up to Elizabeth, and I said, is Mr. Russell still here? She said, he is. I said, would you ask him, can he see me? She said, yes. (laughs) She said, he said, come on up. I went up, walked in, and I said, Lance, this is Billy Woods. He's a manager of Surplus City. He said, I go in there all the time. I said, he's interested in sponsoring the show. He said, boy, you work fast. <laughs> he said, let's talk. And we did a pilot. We did a a, 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 a rough uh, that that night. Where did you get the camera people? Well, Anybody I, I, had, I, had, I had a camera. Yeah. Cotton gave me the camera. And he said, now we need a pilot. Mm-hmm. I call, I was so stupid. Of all people, I called Ralph Giso. He was a guide out of Pendleton Harbor Marina on yeah. Toledo Bend. You know, we had a lot of mess weather and everything. I, I knew I could get a show at Toledo Bend. Uh-huh. Now, why I didn't shoot a local show, I don't know. But Lance didn't care. I called Ralph, and I hooked it to Toledo Bend. And uh, I'll never forget it. I said, Ralph, will you help me get a show? He said, absolutely. We got... And I got the girl, the cook. It's where I met Terry Bridge. Well, I'll say the story in a minute. But anyway, I gave the cook the camera, and I said, it, all you do is just hold the camera. And you know those scoopy cameras are just neat. Yeah. A baby could shoot one of them. She held the camera, and I said, get us pulling away from the dock. She said, okay. And so Ralph and I walked out and got in the boat, and we just pulled out. And she just, and then we turned around and went back and got the camera. And we got out there on the lake, and one of his guides followed us out. And I said, you hold the camera and get some wide shots of us. So here's the guide. <laughs> Never held a camera in his life. He shot some wide shots of us. And I said, get a couple of shots of us catching fish. Ralph knew where every fish in the lake was. And we threw out there and caught a couple of fish. And I said, you get those? He said, I got them. And he gave us a camera. Ralph would shoot me catching fish, and I'd shoot Ralph catching fish. And I'll never forget in that show, we were on some big fish, good fish. Uh, I get this fish about five pounds up beside the boat, and I'm fighting him. And I said, Ralph, he said, let me net him. And so I'm fighting him, and Ralph grabs a net, and he went, Whoop, I got him. And he, he's got this fish about six pounds in the net. And he said, well, that's a good one. And uh, the the guide is, is videoing it. Mm-hmm. And and I'm going, I said, get him now. I'm going to bring him around the boat. And he's got this fish up, six pounds. And I said, what? I said, get my fish. And he went, that's the wrong fish. <laughs> he turned and netted, and he's got a six and my five in the net. <laughs> and, and the guy went, I got it. I got it. <laughs> of course, we weren't shooting audio then, you know. And then I came back, and old Shelton, was a guy taught me how to cut and edit Mm -hmm. and uh i worked and that's what i'd do i'd go shoot a show and then i'd bring it back and i'd edit it and then i'd i'd sketch out my show my format Mm -hmm. and then i'd come in the studio and uh it was so corny i we had a a backdrop like this with two big recliners Uh (laughs) and i'd say well here we are at the lake and now we're getting in the boat. Here we go up the lake. 
<laughs> but that's I mean, how it was done. I, I mean, that's, that's how Jerry exactly. McKinnis' show yeah. was done, too. I mean, oh, that, yeah. you had no other uh, It's so corny. You know, and, and, and I'd have a guest, and maybe, maybe you and I did a show together, and I could say, here's Tom making the first cast, and you'd say, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm getting a bite, Bill. And I said, yep, there's Tom setting the hook. <laughs> oh, isn't that fun? Ha, ha, ha. And <laughs> you'd go, yes, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> We we just ad lib it for thirty minutes for thirty minutes. And so, did this was this effective at selling product through your sponsor? Oh yeah. And then I'd come back and I said, uh, we'd have the baits or whatever it was. And I said, now this is a particular bait that we were using, uh, the old double trouble gym bug, uh, <laughs> that uh, and it's a very effective bait that Cordell has come out with and. Uh, um, this, this bait works exceptionally well. It's not just a seasonal bait. It's a 12-month-a-year lure. I mean, you can fish this bait in muddy water, clear water. Uh, you can throw it up in a tree and a bass will climb a tree to hit this bait. I mean, it's a fantastic <laughs> bait, folks. You just got to, you know. But, uh, and then, you know, and they're available right now at Fabulous Surplus City. In fact, they're on sale this week. You buy one, they'll give you one. <laughs> wow. Just go down there and buy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's incredible. So, all of this happened spur of the moment, but with a lot of hard work. I mean, you obviously put it on the line. So all of this opportunity seems to me like you were just kind of living your life, doing something that you like to do, and then here comes these opportunities over and over. Did this interrupt something that you were, I mean, that you were trying to do in your well, life? You know, the, I continued to fish the tournaments, but what? how this thing it it blossomed it got uh, the sister station in jackson mississippi mm -hmm. saw this show and they contacted me and said the abc affiliate in jackson said hey we saw your show in memphis would you be willing to do one for us and i said yeah it, well it was good because the state capitol was there mm -hmm. the governor was a fisherman mm. billy joe cross who i knew was uh the director of the Game and Fish Commissioner, yep. uh, director. Uh, I had fished Barnett. I'd won a tournament on Barnett, and I knew a lot of places. I knew a lot of fishermen there. Uh, so I said, sure. So I started doing a local show in Jackson, hmm. and I had people there I could call from the, the state office. And the governor would come. He'd be a guest on the show. Oh, wow. And then I had the uh, boating safety director. I had the game and fish director. And I had local fishermen. I could, uh, and then I could fish over at Show One, Lake Washington, Lake Lee, Ross Barnett, and do shows. Well, then WBRZ Channel 2 in Baton Rouge said, hey, their sister station said, will you do one for us? And I said, yeah. <laughs> well, then I had the capital of Louisiana, Baton Rouge. Uh -huh. I had the same deal there, all the state officials. So I started doing one at Baton Rouge. Then J.C. Penney used to be in the sporting good business. Paducah, Kentucky, up near Kentucky Lake. I got a call from them and said, well, would you do one for us? So I was doing, I said, yeah. <laughs> so I ended up, Memphis was my bread and butter. Uh -huh. I had to do it every week. So I would go to Jackson and tape four shows, line up all my guests, then run down to Baton Rouge and tape four shows. And I'd use the footage, some of Memphis footage, some of Jackson, mm -hmm. Mississippi, Baton Rouge footage. Then I'd run up to Paducah and tape four shows. <laughs> and I'd mix the, vi the video, I mean, the, the, the footage up on all markets, you know, rotate. Right. So I'm doing four markets, 52 weeks a year. I was in. I was doing two hundred and eight shows a year. Wow! Now, who's editing all this? Are you Me? doing? You're doing all the editing. I, I was. I was writing, scripting, shooting, editing all, all all my shows, and lining up all my guests. And I was doing two hundred and eight shows a year. Well, wow. I said, "Sonny Jim," <laughs> I said, "Let's make a freight train take a dirt road." I said, "Boy," and I and I'm fishing in the tournaments too. And I went, and so after I, we syndicated, Advancers in St. Louis said, Bill, you need to syndicate this. So we syndicated. 
I gave Bobby Matters my show in Baton Rouge, mm-hmm. and then I, I I stopped I stopped Kentucky, I mean uh, Paducah, and I stopped Jackson. Yeah. And Memphis, I kept Memphis for a little bit, and I said, I was going around in circles trying yeah. to trying to do promotions. You know how that is for mm-hmm. sponsors because mm-hmm. you do that, and uh, trying to do what I could and fishing tournaments and stuff. And I, I finally had to give up tournaments for a year. I just couldn't do it all. Yeah. And uh, finally I said, uh, I'm going to do this syndication. So we syndicated 90 network markets. Wow. And uh, the cost of syndication skyrocketed. Cable was starting to come into play. And we went with ESPN. And we rocked along with ESPN for about two or three years. And we hit the markets we hit new york toronto montreal buffalo uh minneapolis uh boise uh spokane Mm -hmm. uh san francisco denver dallas miami uh new orleans atlanta i mean we hit we hit the all the way across the country total saturation yeah total saturation but we didn't hit the demographics that we really needed to hit. Hmm. And uh, after about a little over two years, we just didn't hit that loyal brand buying market that we really needed to hit. And there was a little network that popped up over in Nashville, Tennessee, called TNN, yeah. the Nashville Network. And we looked at that, and I went, boom, we better look at that. And we looked at TNN. Well, TNN had bull riding. Mm-hmm. They had country western. They had the demographics were just perfect. Right. We picked up Walmart. We picked up Chevrolet. We picked up. I mean, we hit a we hit a niche that was just perfect. And uh, we moved we moved there, and our numbers just went through the roof. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just a perfect niche. The demographics couldn't have been better. Right. I happen to know a little bit about that because my first television experience ever was on Shaw Grigsby's show. He was on TNN at right. that same time. Hey, Shaw was. And it was, if I'm not mistaken, was it a Monday night or a Thursday night? Well, I think it was a Thursday night when it when it started. There was one night when it was just yeah, that, record that, that was the night that we promoted and then it moved to Saturdays, I think. Yeah. This was an a weird night. I want to say it was a Monday, but maybe it was a Thursday. And um so Shaw came down. He was going to do a vi- uh, a, a show with um someone else, Marshall Maybe Kutcher. it was Monday. I I can't remember. Could, I think it might have been cuz I I was surprised that there were so many people watching. And it was about a half million people as I remember. There were the the numbers were through the roof. Anyway, Shaw uh, or Marshall Cutchin didn't want to do the show, so he told him to call me. And I said, sure, I'll do it. I don't know anything <laughs> yeah, about it. I'll go I don't know it. anything about it, but I, I guess. And so Shaw, I took Shaw, and we caught Barracudas, big Barracudas. I had a great show, and I didn't know anything about – I mean, there was no social media. There wasn't anything. Shaw says it's coming on sometime soon. And one day, the phone exploded. It just wouldn't stop ringing, and I didn't know what happened because I didn't see the show live. I didn't know anything about it, and the phone just started ringing and ringing and ringing, and it rang for months, and this is back when we had an answering machine with tape, and that tape would be full, and I'd put in another one, and it just was insane, the number of people that were watching that, and like you say, the demographic was absolutely oh, it was, perfect. Oh, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And the the response to that one show led me to believe, wow, there's something to television because I've never seen anything like this. Oh, it was unbelievable. It was it was crazy. Well, we 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 stayed with that for almost 15 years, mm-hmm. and then Vicon came in and bought the Gaylord uh, that that enterprise in mm-hmm. there, and they moved him to New York. Then we went with OLN, mm-hmm. the Outdoor Life Network, and then. Spike, I think, came in there, and then uh, NBC Sports. Then we went with NBC Sports, mm-hmm. and then with the Discovery, uh, that deal with, and then with, and then came along the Outdoor Channel, then the Sportsman Channel, and so we were running four networks: NBC Sports, 
Discovery, uh, Outdoor Channel, mm -hmm. and Sportsman Channel. And then when we looked at the numbers and compared the numbers, so where we are now, we're back with uh, we're 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 with the Outdoor Channel and the Sportsman Channel. Well, that's only on on television. We're going to talk about the social media here in a little bit and how how that's all changed. But um, that's that's very interesting. I had no idea that you worked so hard to get this whole thing going. I mean, you're producing four shows at a time. That's that's incredible. And I I I want to talk to you about that, but believe it or not, with an hour and a half, we're going to run out of time. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. One, I want to know one of the things that that I have always liked about you the most was that you are humble enough to put your blooper video out because a lot of people wouldn't Right. Like a lot of people don't think it's funny to watch themselves fall down a hill or get chased by a goose or hit their <laughs> hit their shin on the on the trailer hitch. But I want to know what it was like for you to think about putting that out. What did that look like? Well, it's just part. It's just it's, it's just part of the things that happen. Yeah. I mean, you know, we uh, that thing came about. Uh, Tony Mack, our producer, we had. Uh, I'll tell you how it, it, it came about. Uh, I think Tony came up with uh, an idea to insert uh, an outtake. <laughs> and uh, so he, he he stuck it in a show. And the response was real good. Yeah. Social media wasn't going at that time. And uh, he just stuck it in a show. And the response was, was real good. We got a lot of comments on it. And uh, so a few weeks passed, and he said, why don't we just dig through the archives and do a show on and entitle it uh, Outtakes or something? Uh -huh. And I said, he said, you have a problem with that? And I said, no, nah, I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> And I, I really didn't because it, I thought it was funny. Yeah. Uh, just outtakes and things, stupid things that happen. <laughs> and, and it was unbelievable when you have two camera shoots. And he, and he told the camera crew, he said, from now on when things happen, don't cut the camera off. Just let it roll. And uh, it was unbelievable how much stuff uh, over all the years that they started digging back through uh, all our – footage yeah. and, and stuff that they found and, and could come up with and so he compiled a uh, super bloopers and practical jokes or something <laughs> that was a title that ed mcmahon and dick clark and we got a call from them and tony talked to them their agency and they said we'd like to run a couple of those bloopers uh -huh. and they were doing a deal on saturday night and that was the title of that show uh, Dick Clark Productions had super bloopers and practical show. So Tony sent them. And then, short time after that, the BBC in London, <laughs> we got a note from them, and they wanted a couple of them. And so Tony, so Tony said, well, you know, this thing. And then we got a note from CBS, and they picked up. They, they started a blooper show. Mm -hmm. And then Rogan's Heroes in California – started a blooper show and they wanted so tony says well i'll tell you what i'm gonna do i'll just put together a contract and we'll sell these things well we had a contract with nbc that they wanted eight a year yeah and then cbs wanted x amount a year and then the bbc in london uh wanted so many a year so we just sent them a contract and we had a little profitable thing going right there yeah. that we could still run what we wanted to and then Tony said, um, what we ought to do is just make a blooper tape. So we came out with volume one, uh -huh. and it just went boom. It went off the charts. And, and then, you, would, you would advertise that on your own show. Yeah, well, I think uh, Bass Pro put it in, and they just sold a living starch <laughs> out of them. And then we still had a pile of stuff. Somebody said, when are you going to come out with blooper two? I said, well, we'll just do it right now. So we had enough stuff. <laughs> and then we had bloopers with entertainers like Mel Tillis yeah. and, and Porter Wagner and Terry Bradshaw and 
a, a bunch of entertainers that we had fished with over the years. And uh, so we just stuck some of the wild stuff that they had done in there. And uh, so we came with Blooper 2. And then people started saying, well, when are you going to come out with Blooper 3? So we said, all right, we'll just do that too. <laughs> so we just, we'd look back and we had enough for Blooper 3. And they, even today, it's 15 years, they are still running pieces out of Blooper 1. That big swan. Yeah. We went over there to do a piece uh, at, uh, it was at Charles's. His wife wanted a big, big swan. And we're standing over there on the, his pond behind Charles's house demonstrating something. And we looked up, and somebody said, watch out. And I looked up, and you could see the dust. <laughs> and this big old swan is coming down the lake bank like a runaway dump truck. And I said, what's he doing? And he said, you better get out of the way. <laughs> He's going to knock you over. And, I mean, that big, big swan, I mean, it's as big as a Volkswagen. I mean, it's coming, blah, 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 coming down through there. And, I mean, it's coming right at me. And, boy, I jumped out of the way, and it went, boom, it went by. And when it made a U-turn, it banked like a jet airplane. As it banked, it saw itself in the bumper on the truck. It peeled off and started beating the fire out of that bumper. <laughs> and I said, that goose, I mean, that, that stupid thing's crazy. <laughs> and it was going boom, 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 just beating, flogging that bumper on that truck. And I, I walked over and I said, "What?" And about that time, it saw me in that bumper, and boom, it made a U-turn, and boom, it took off after <laughs> me. And I took off running. Well, I didn't have any place to run except I didn't know where the rocks were in that lake. I'd either run across the top of the water on that lake, or fight him off with that rod. And boy, he started flogging me. And <laughs> Pete. <laughs> She picked the camera, and he started videoing it. I mean, he just beat me all over that lake bank, that picking thing. and biting. And so those were just funny things that happened. But uh, we got that, and, oh, it's just funny things. The trolling motor jumping off the boat. Hilarious. And uh, those things I watched, in the boat. I watched all those with my kids. I watched those with my dad. I just thought they were the funniest thing ever. Well, we had uh, – we've had a lot of uh, – Ladies, parents, women tell us it's been the best babysitter they ever had because they just take it, put it in the, put it in the VCR, and the kids just lay there on a pillow and watch it. Yeah. And they go on and cook dinner and come back and look, and kids are just still laying there on the pillow. You know. <laughs> then we came with a three hours, a three hour one. Wow. And uh, that one really is a good babysitter. I bet it is. So I bet it, it is. it's been, it, it's been a been a good thing no it didn't doesn't bother me it's just things that happen if, if you if you can't laugh at yourself you're missing the best material. absolutely, That's absolutely. What they say. so what about the what about the tea <laughs> hat the tea cap goes back to uh i grew up with the majors oh uh, really uh, johnny majors uh -huh. and larry and bill majors over in lynchburg that's where they're from mm -hmm. shirley majors was a coach of the lynchburg raiders he coached them four and a half years and they were undefeated before they moved over to huntland mm -hmm. and then John became coach at Sewanee, and then, uh, not John, but Shirley, John's daddy. And uh, but I've stayed close to John. He's over at Knoxville now. But mm -hmm. uh, even when uh, he was with Tennessee, but I love Tennessee, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, I love the football program. Of course, we were working our way back. Yeah, we we're climbing out of well. Yeah, we we we've, we've, we've had, dark years. Yeah, I know we've had some. Some slow years, but we're coming back. It'll come back. Oh, I, we I will. We're, we're too good at we're too good at university not to come back. We'll, we'll be back. So um, when did you decide that was going to be your your iconic look? Well, I got a call from uh, the uh, one of the recruiters over there, and uh, the one of the coaches, and it was a young recruit, a young player that loved to fish. And one of the coaches over there said, uh, see if uh, – does Bill know this player? Randy Sanders was one of the coaches, and uh, they were trying to recruit Randy Sanders. And uh, I said, uh, I'll call him. 
So I called him, and I was telling him how great fishing was. I said, we've got 26 great major lakes in Tennessee. We've got the world record smallmouth. We've got the world record walleye. I said, oh, man, we've got beautiful streams. We've got this and that. And come to Tennessee and play football for Tennessee. He said, boy, I'd love to take you fishing. And uh, we hyped in. Every time Randy could go, I couldn't go. And when Randy could go, I couldn't go. And so I was hyping it. And Doug Dickey. Uh, sent me my sent me a tea cap, and I I wore it. And as soon as I got, I won a tournament. Ah. And then I won another tournament. And so <laughs> then it became a trademark, and I've worn I've worn this hat ever since. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And then Doug became uh, he left Tennessee and went down to Florida, became AD down there, and then he came back to Tennessee and became AD. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I got a call from him right before he left Tennessee and wanted me to come walk with him out in midfield and uh, at a homecoming game. And I couldn't because I had a promotion. And it was very disappointing I, that I couldn't make that make that homecoming game with, with him. But Doug Dickey, I got those tea caps from Doug Dickey, and I've worn them ever since. Mm-hmm. And we go through a lot of tea caps. But, Did that player come to Tennessee and play? Uh, yes. Who was it? Uh, uh, Sanders. Sanders? Uh-huh. Be nice if it was Peyton Manning. It'd be, oh, that'd yeah. be a good story. Oh yeah, <laughs> but that's uh, he he came to Tennessee. He really did. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. So, um, Randy Sanders. What about the Saltwater Show? Let's talk about the Saltwater Show. Well, it took me. F- that's your bag. Yeah, uh, your uh, and your buddy helped me a lot with Saltwater uh, Tudor, but. Um, we had been doing salt water, uh, excuse me, we'd been doing fresh water for a long time. And we got to a point where we just, you know, we looked at hunting and uh, we started a hunting show way back yonder. And uh, we just didn't think it was going to pan out. So we just stuck with fishing, mm-hmm. uh, fresh water fishing. And then we got to a point where we'd just gone as far as we could go. And I said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to do a salt water show. And so we formatted it similar to the way we did our freshwater show. Mm-hmm. And I went to a network, and I talked to the program director, and I told him what I had in mind, and he says, I like it. Let's do it. And so we went to the sponsors, which was a hard thing to do, as you well know. <laughs> and I pitched it, and they liked it. They said, okay, let's do it. So then I went, and I started picking places, and I figured I'd better start inshore Mm -hmm. because more people could relate to inshore, more people can afford to do inshore than... Same kind of equipment for the most part. Right, and uh, more so than offshore. Mm -hmm. And so, and they could relate to that because a lot of inshore is a lot like bass fishing to, to a degree. And so... Tudor was one of the first guests. Yeah, and I did I did quite a few shows with with Rich. Yeah, uh, uh, and he's very knowledgeable, and that's what I wanted. And I asked him lots of questions. We did permit shows. We did shark shows. We did uh, uh, I don't know. We did a uh, we did a Grand Slam show. Mm-hmm. You remember? Yep, I do. Uh, we did. We caught bonefish. In fact, we did beyond a Grand Slam. We caught redfish. We caught bonefish, we caught tarpon, and we caught uh, permit. Yeah. And uh, we caught four different species in one show. <laughs> uh, well, Rich told me about all of that. And uh, one of the things that, one of the things about Rich and all over the years of fishing with him and fishing in the tournaments and fishing just on the day to day deal, he's pretty, he's pretty high strung and he's got a, oh, he a, is. a, a rem- remarkable amount of energy. Oh, he for, does. He does. I mean, he just, he'll fish everybody into the dirt and the camera guys are dying. They haven't eaten lunch. And he's like, well, let's start another show. And it's six thirty in the afternoon and we got that one. Let's start another one. And they're like, man, you're killing us. You're absolutely killing us. And <clears throat> even, you know, I try to stay in really good shape. I have a hard time keeping up with him as far as, as oh, he does fish. have a lot of He energy. wants to go and go and go. So he calls me up and he says, man, so how did it go? He said, I can't keep up with Bill Dance. He's got 
the most energy I've ever seen in my life. He said, he, we've, we did this show. We got this. We caught a permit, a tarpon, and a bonefish. And then we catch a redfish. And then he wants to keep fishing till dark. I mean, what else could we possibly catch? I and, know, and I, I stay on him. He said, he does. And he goes, well, what do you want to do now? I said, well, we need to do. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I said, no. And he said, that rain's going to get us. I said, well, Matt, now it looks like it's moving south. No, I think it's moving straight at us. I said, no, I don't think so. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> he was ready. You I had said, him. Come on, Rich. You, you fished him into the ground, and he was ready to come home. And I don't know anybody, anyone, that has been able to do that. So, how do you how do you keep up this amazing amount of energy that you have? I don't know. It's just <laughs> the determination, just wanting to get the best I can possibly get. Yeah, and to, to deliver the best quality that we can possibly deliver. Um, you know, I I think you know that was a good shot, and that was a good jump, and that was a good thing. But maybe the next one's going to be just a little bit better. I don't know. I just, I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm there, and I don't know. We push real hard to make it the best we can possibly make it. And we do it with good people. And But just, uh, I don't know. We work real, real hard. The, you, it's do it with, planning. you do it with good people, but you also have a good team around you. You're, oh, you're, you couldn't I, make it without a good team. I, I know, and I, I feel the same way. How long has your current team been together? Whoa, the people we've been working with, uh, I would say, uh, how long have we been working together, Pete? 33 years. How long? 33. 33 years. Yeah, Pete's been shooting with me 33 years. Timmy's been, uh, <laughs> how long? Timmy in the back. 25. 25. 25. <laughs> and then, uh. Of course, Tony passed away this past year. Tony's been with me for, what, 40? We lost Tony about uh, this past year. How long, 45? Tony's uh, been with me for then 45. Then you got family working with you. And then uh, Billy, of course, has been with me for 30 years. And he does all, a, lot of, a lot of our social stuff, our Facebook. And then... Uh, Don has been with me, does all our uh, bookkeeping. and Well, that says a lot about, about you as a, as a leader. How do you manage to, to keep that team together like that? We just, everybody knows what their responsibilities are, and everybody does it. Everybody's got their own little niche, and I don't even have to be here. They know <laughs> what to do, and uh, they do it, uh, and they take a lot of pride in what they do. Uh, you know, you're only as good as the people that work for you. And so uh, we're like a chain. Sometimes I'm the first link on that chain. Sometimes I'm the middle part of that chain. And sometimes I'm the last link in that chain. But everybody just pulls together. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what it takes. But everybody just kind of knows what to do. And we just we, we just we work together to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So we do 39 original shows a year. And that's a lot. Yeah. That's fresh and saltwater. Right? That's fresh and saltwater. 26 fresh and 13 and we we air 52 weeks a year so it's it's uh and then carlton handles our sponsor relations right. work uh so it just been working know. with carlton for a long time too oh right? yeah yeah uh so we've got um i don't know every year we just we've got good sponsors we've had some sponsors uh our board motor sponsor we've had for oof 45 years yeah uh like our retail sponsor we've had oof, going on 30 years well that retail sponsor is none other than bass pro shops right and you have a you have a a really good relationship with johnny morris yeah johnny and i've been buddies for 45 years and so you saw that that business develop oh yeah from nothing right i mean from well i remember when john uh when Johnny used to talk about he wanted to get into the retail business, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he'd talk about, he'd dream about. And I've, I've watched his dreams. Uh, he'd talk about things he wanted to do, and I've watched those dreams become reality. And he's just got an amazing ability to think things and make things happen. Mm -hmm. And it's just, he'd look at something, and he'd say, I remember the, the gigantic pyramid in Memphis. Mm -hmm. 
and we walked in we walked into that pyramid uh 13 years ago and it was a dirt floor mm. and we just come off the mississippi river catfishing and uh it was a cold day and we were standing there and he looked down at the floor and he looked way up at the top of the pyramid it was just you know a vacant type thing and he said bill we're gonna do this deal and i said okay and he said you know we could put a big cypress tree over here, 80-foot cypress tree, and we can put some cypress trees here. And he can make a cypress tree. You would, Yeah, they, you, they look looks, exactly like it. They look identical to a cypress identical. tree. You, you'll stand beside it, and somebody will bet you that's, that's, that's a real tree. And it, it looks identical to a tree. Mm -hmm. And we'll put some 80-foot trees here, some 60-foot trees here, and we'll, we'll put the river We'll put part of the river through here, and we'll put native fish, uh, gar, alligator gar, crappie, bass, uh, that are native to the river uh, here. And then we'll put a freestanding elevator right here, 325 feet, all the way to the top. And you're just watching all of this just happen in his head yeah, right yeah, there. He and, just and goes just, and he concepts and he the whole thing. Then we can put an aquarium up in the top of the pyramid. And we can put catfish there. You can get them out of the river, can't you? I said, yeah. And and we'll put them here. And uh, and and he said, I'm getting excited. I'm getting excited. And he'll just start shaking. And he'll hold. He'll he'll start. He'll get a hold of you, and he'll start sh and shaking you. And he'll say, I'm getting excited, boy. When he says that, and he says, and it, and and we can take. And then he'll. We can do this, can't we? And I said, Yep, we can do it. You, yeah, Johnny. Anything you believe, you can do it. And he says, and 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 then we then and then we can do this and we can do that. And when you look and you walk in that place, it will blow your mind away mm -hmm. at what he's done. Do you and see said, it? Do you see it that he's been able to? to has that original? Has that original uh, vision that he had? It's there. It's it's there. It what what Dead he on. said when we're standing on that dirt floor. <laughs> everything it just the few things that he mentioned they're there yeah they're they're there now there's 150 pound alligator gar swimming right through there there's bass there there's there's gar there i mean there's a uh, crappie there there's uh, those native to the mississippi river they're there and that free flowing water that comes right through there uh those cypress trees are there well he's a he's certainly the hotel's a there there's a hundred and 15 rooms there yeah that place is incredible and he's a he's a guy just like you said like you're you're going on a film shoot it's always the next one it's always the next one it's not good enough let's keep polishing keep polishing i mean you go to his stores and every little detail the handle of the door and every little thing that you look around there's details on every little thing and he's he's definitely i've seen polishing. him walking i've seen him walk in a room and he'd look and he says <clears throat> no a storage area needs to be six inches wider. They said, well, we've already put, I don't care, take it out. It needs to be six inches wider. Just <laughs> <laughs> take it all out. He, he, he wants it this way, that way. He, it, it's got to be. Well, it it's works. Gotta, it works. He's a he's an amazing guy. It and he's works. the same Johnny Mars today as he was 45 years ago. Very humble. Mm -hmm. Very appreciative. And, uh, and he's been able to build that from starting out in his uh, dad's Clo a closet in his dad's store is that is that accurate? yeah i remember i remember he called me uh he said uh, he called me one night and he said hey daddy gave me the back of the store <laughs> and i said and his daddy had a chain of uh, uh spirit stores mm -hmm. liquor stores mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said daddy gave me the back of the store and i said he did he said yeah i'm gonna have a grand opening in about uh a few weeks will you come up for my grand opening and i said well absolutely just let me know <clears throat> well he called me and he said it's going to be a week from saturday will you be here i said i'll be there and so i flew up friday and spent the night with him and we got up that saturday morning went trout fishing and i caught a big big <laughs> rainbow and uh biggest one i'd ever caught and we drove to the store and I'll never forget it over there on Kearney. As we drove up, the police were directing traffic on that corner. Uh -huh. And it was a Brown Derby liquor store. 
and up on this big post pole was a marquee, and it said, Jack Daniels, half gallons, 1895. <laughs> Jim Bean, half gallons, 1495. Welcome. Bill Dan. <laughs> and I thought, buddy, I made the big time. My name's up there with Jack Daniels. <laughs> and uh, I couldn't get over it. I went in that store. And if you go to Bass Pro in Springfield, uh -huh. he's got replicas of that, you know, a little. He's got pictures of all that. But uh, I remember going in that store, and he had a little old bitty aquarium. You ought to see the aquariums over there now. Oh, I know. Oh, they're oh goodness, hundred to three hundred gallon aquarium, uh, but bigger than that. But he had a little old box aquarium, and he put crappie in there and bass in there. And the bass ate all the crappie. <laughs> but he, he had the little box aquarium, and uh, but he had spinner baits, old Virgil Ward spinner baits, and people were buying. I was accustomed to selling. One or two spinner baits. People were buying the whole card, a dozen <laughs> spinner baits at a time. This this was a big time deal. Yeah. And his daddy, I remember the story. Johnny had rods in a in a barrel, and they were really classy looking rods. I mean, the cosmetics on the rod. Mm -hmm. I mean, the wraps were good, the the guides were good, the the handles, the the rods were really nice looking rods, and he had them priced at. Uh, Twenty four ninety five, hmm. and John A. His daddy, he picked that rod up and he went, "Ooh, John, Johnny, this is a nice looking rod. Twenty four ninety five, And Johnny said, "Yes, sir." And John A. looked at Johnny and he says, "You selling this rod for twenty four ninety five? And he said, "Yes, sir." He said, "I just don't understand how you can sell a rod like this this nice for twenty four ninety five. How much did this rod cost you?" And uh, Johnny looked at him. And, no, I'm telling this wrong. <laughs> he says, "How much does this rod cost?" He said, "You selling this rod for nineteen ninety five?" And he said, "Yes, sir." He says. You mean to tell me you can sell a rod, this quality rod, for nineteen ninety five? And Johnny said, Yes, sir. And he said, Son, I just don't understand how you can sell a rod like this for twenty if up to nineteen ninety five. And Johnny said, Yes, sir. He said, Well, how much does a rod like this cost you? And he said, Twenty four ninety five. And he said, This rod costs you twenty four ninety five, son, and you're selling it for nineteen ninety five? And uh he said, Yes, sir. He said You'll never make it in this business, boy. <laughs> You'll never make it in this business. And uh, but they, his daddy, of course, being John A. being in the liquor business, you know, he said, "Daddy, you just don't understand. It's it's a leader. It's a leader. Hmm. These people will buy all these rods, but they'll buy a reel to go with it, and they'll buy a line to go on the reel, and they'll buy baits to go with it." And he says, "I don't understand that." He said, "I know you don't, but he says probably not many people did back then." I mean that was that was contrary, right? I mean, no, there there were leaders, you know. I, he, I he he's had a vision of how he does that and takes care of his customers and he and he brings people into the sport and then they in they in turn buy thousands and thousands of dollars in boats and motors. Well, you know, and everything they, else. The merchants don't do it a lot of that today. But I remember back in those early days. That, remember, I was telling you about fabulous surplus city. Yeah, they did a lot of that hmm. and they sold a lot of merchandise. Hmm. And we we do so much impulse buying today, and they do a lot of leader stuff. They did a lot of leader stuff back then, you know. Yeah. Anything to get you in the store. Huh. All right. So I want to ask a couple more questions. You pointed at that bait right there when we first came in here. You said that that supercharged your career. It kickstarted my let me, career. Let me see what it is. And, and This old bait? Yeah. I've told this story before. Um, as I told you one time, the only place you could buy – Fishing tackle. Uh, back when I was growing up, we didn't have Bass Pro Shops, and we didn't have Walmarts and Academies and mm -hmm. uh, Cabela's. The only place you could buy fishing tackle was a hardware store. Right. Well, growing up in Lynchburg, Tennessee, there was one place 
that sold fishing tackle, and that was Connor Motlow's. And Connor Motlow had a hardware store. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Connor Motlow's brother, Reger, ran the distillery, Jack Daniels Distillery. And these are the Motlows. <laughs> Lim Motlow was uh-huh. the proprietor of Jack Daniels Distillery. And his brother had the bank. And But anyway, I'd go by that hardware store all the time. And old Clayton Tosh was a manager of that hardware store. And I'd run in there and I says, I looked in that through that glass case and I says, Tosh, let me see that bait. And he had Arbogast baits, and this was an Arbogast bait. Mm-hmm. And he'd pull those Hawaiian wigglers out. <laughs> yeah, I remember and that. And he'd, pu- he'd, he'd pull this exact bait out. I mean, a bait just like it, old frog-colored jitterbug. And I'd look at that bait, and I said, how much is that bait, Tosh? He said, Billy. My grandmother called me Billy. He said, it's the same price today as it was yesterday, the day before, <laughs> last week, and the week before. 75 cents. I think it's, and I said, hmm, I bet he'd catch a bass. He said, he'll catch a bass. And I'd take it out and I'd just look at it and I says, hmm, a jitterbug. Boy, boy, boy. That's the prettiest bait I believe I've ever seen. Hmm. <laughs> there. Let me look at it one more time. <laughs> Boy, can I run short to my grandmother? He said, yeah, bring it back. I, I run short. And I said, grandmother, ain't that the prettiest bait you ever saw? She said, what is that thing? I said, <laughs> they call it a jitterbug. See, it's written right there. My, my. I said, it ain't but 75 cents. Is that right? Yeah, 75 cents. I got to take it back. Tosh told me to bring it back. Boy, just 75 cents. Hmm. I'm going to take it back. Just 75 cents. <laughs> <laughs> I took it back. Well, finally, I talk about it. And I said, I'm going down at the hardware store and look at that bait. <laughs> and she says, she reached, she had a handkerchief. She undid her handkerchief. She reached in that handkerchief. She took three quarters. She said, here. She said, when you go, give Tosh that three quarters and get you that bait. And man, I'll tell you one thing. I went like I was, like a, I mean, you couldn't, <laughs> I was flying. I ran in there and I bought that bait. Uh-huh. But I, we went, the, everybody in in town would close up on every Wednesday. The, the square, everybody on the square would close up, you know, uh-huh. and everybody would do different things. But town would close up on Wednesday half a day. Well, we went. We didn't go to the creek that day. Granddad and grandmother and I, we went to Cumberland Springs Lake. It was up the road about seven eight miles, and grandmother would spread a would spread a a quilt under the shade tree, and She'd take two or three double colas and put them on a stringer and just pitch them out there. And there was a little spring that came in down by that tree, and she'd just pitch them right in that spring. And Granddaddy would take his rods, old Langley mm-hmm. and Shakespeare reels, and he'd throw them out, and he'd fish for red ears with, with, with worms. Mm-hmm. He had a worm bed there in the backyard, or in the, in the back. And I took a bait casting rod that it was a metal rod in fact it's in my office and uh and it had braided line on it and a section of cat gut hmm. that we call monofilament today mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i went down on right probably from here to the road out there and i got on that point and i i did Made two or three false casts and loosened the tension up on that little Shakespeare reel and that little true temper metal rod. And I looked to my right, and when I did, I saw two bass swimming along. If I had that that book, I'd show you a picture of it. It's up there in my my office. But anyway, uh, and uh, I looked. 
and I saw a bass about two pounds. Mm-hmm. And I saw another bass about a pound swimming along. And I went, look a yonder. And I made my heart started beating like this. And I said, I'm going to make a cast. And I, I went through about four or five fa- false casts. And I went, boom, I threw. And I made a pretty good cast. The bait landed about 20 feet from the fish. Uh-huh. That was a pretty good cast. <laughs> <laughs> but, and the bait hit the water. I'd always remembered, my granddad being a doctor, it always talked to me about, taught me a lot about anatomy, like wading the creeks, walking on rocks, mm-hmm. and, you know, on the gravel. Mm-hmm. Creeks were clear. And the rock bed creeks and limestone bluffs and stuff. And cr- walking on those rocks, how well fish could hear and sight. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lot about the anatomy, which helped me a lot through the years. And... So anyway, uh, so anyway. Look at that. Uh, here, 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 oh, wow. here was that old rod. That's the same lure I used when I was a kid. Right that's here, an old double Shan- spinner. Yeah, that's that old Shannon twin spin. Yeah. But here, here's that old rod, an old braided line. Wow. But I got my. There's one just like this in my dad's. Uh, something similar. I don't know if it's exactly the same rod. A metal rod like this. Yeah. Um, heavy man. Yeah, it's heavy. But, and and a couple of these reels too. Yeah, you throw it and it goes, Wah! you know, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a cat getting ready to fight. <laughs> but the, uh, but anyway the the so anyway I made the cast, and but when the bait hit, what impressed me, both bass stopped. Well, that told me those fish heard that bait, and I remember. What my granddad taught me, he said, I said, sound. They heard that bait, they heard that bait hit, and it went bloop when it hit. Well, I went, blah, 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 blah. I started reeling the bait. Mm-hmm. Well, both fish turned in the direction of the bait, and I said, they heard that bait. And I went, blah, 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 blah. well, both fish turned and started moving toward the bait. And the big, he said, the bigger fish was more, would be more aggressive. Well, it led the pack. It mm-hmm. was ahead of the smaller fish. Well, they swim within about half the distance to the bait, and I stopped the bait, and they stopped. And I said, so I started the bait, and they started. I stopped the bait, they'd stop. I start the bait, they'd start. I'd stop, they'd stop. I'd start, they'd start. Well, finally, I kind of got a little closer, and they were within two feet of the bait. And I know now they were in visual con- in visual contact with the bait. They could mm-hmm. see the bait. Mm-hmm. As I started the bait up, the two pounder just went shoom, and just blew into the bait. Mm-hmm. You could see the bait. And when he did, you know, I, I pulled back with this this great piece of <laughs> <laughs> doing. Yeah, <laughs> you see it. Yeah, well, it's got some good backbone. Yeah, it ought to. It's steel. But uh, then I started winding. And and I wound about four or five times like this, and the fish jumped. And I wound a little bit more, and he jumped again. And I got so excited, I just threw the rod over my head, and I grabbed hold of this braided line. And I just started well roping him, oink, 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 oink. And uh, I just pulled him right up on that point. Uh-huh. Of course, I could see it all because the water was so clear because it was a spring-fed lake, Cumberland Springs. And when I got him up on the bank, I just pulled him up on the bank. And uh, uh then he was flopping. I was just reeled the line up as fast as I could, and I just took off running. <laughs> and I ran to, to where my grandmother and granddaddy were, and I held him up. I showed him the fish, and here's the fish. Look at that. That's awesome. And that's and there's the jitterbug. Yeah, there's right the jitterbug. There. I don't know if you can see it or not, but that's but amazing. Check out those U.S. kids' shoes. I know. Those are popular today. My daughter wears those. Uh, they, they, they brought con- them back. High top Converse, they call yeah. them now. They're pretty much the same deal. Yeah. That uh, that bait was made in, ni- in 1934. Mm-hmm. And uh, surprisingly, it's still made today. Works. In fact, we did a show on it last year. Did you? Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, That's cool. But the thing is that... Uh, what you can learn 
uh, but it really kick-started my career, you know, learning about it was your first sponsorship. Huh? That was your first sponsorship. Well, your grandmother. Uh, yeah, she gave you the 75 right. cents. Yeah, she gave me the <laughs> she gave me the uh 75 cents to buy that bait. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you turned that 75 cents uh into into something a little bit bigger. Well, I mean, what what impressed me though uh, that I tricked a uh a, a living creature into hitting a piece of plastic that had a piece of metal on it. And I ran, I showed that to Tosh and he said, "Well, I know you loved that bait." And I said, "I really did." And of course, grandmother was real happy, and she was well. The seventy-five cents worked. It sure did. Well, she what do you it. think the the create of all the the stuff that you've seen being creative? I mean, bass fishing over the years has had some pretty wacky ideas. Well, I've what seen do you think I, the craziest I, idea. Oh, I've seen some crazy things. I've seen people come out with ideas that they thought were great, mm-hmm. but. Uh, that I've seen things go to market that uh, that people really, really believed in. Deep down in their heart, they really thought they hit, were going to make a, a fortune on it. Mm-hmm. it that it just didn't go anywhere. Right. But uh, but I've seen other things that have hit the market that uh, uh, have done exceptionally well. Uh, I've I've seen back when this whole thing started. I looked and I said, "This can't get any better." And five years later, I said, boy, look here. Right. And then 10 years passed, and I, I looked, and I said, my goodness, look where it's going. And then 15 years, and then 20 years. And I look at the uh, marine industry, our engines today, yeah, our four-stroke engines. It's amazing. Incredible. Uh, I look at our boats, mm-hmm. how comfortable they are, how, how they take us places, but they bring us back home safely. The construction of our boats. Mm-hmm. I look at our, our trolling motors. Uh, but the one thing that has really impressed me is our electronics. Mm. Uh, it's amazing what our electronics mm. do. Uh, and there's features now in our electronics that, uh, uh, without being commercialized, you know, going into being real commercial, but uh, it's almost like uh, live video. We mm-hmm. have things now that we, we can we can see things. We can see things move. We can throw a bait. We can see our bait running. We can see fish hit our baits. Uh, we can pinpoint uh, uh, key irregular features. We can see cover. We can see fish on that cover. We can throw to that cover. We can catch those fish on that cover. We can see four fish on that cover. We can throw and catch that fish, and we can look back and see three fish on that cover. Mm. We can throw back and catch that fish and see two fish on that cover. Catch all four of them, and there's no fish on that cover. Right. Electronics have really impressed me how far we've advanced in our electronics. I look at uh, our lines that go on our reels, Mm -hmm. how sensitive they are, how strong they are. Uh, Our drag systems on our reels. Our sensitivity, our, the weight of our rods, how powerful they are, how sensitive they are. Uh, it, it's just a, everything that's come along. Uh, the uh, How far advanced we, we have moved in, in every single thing that we have. Mm-hmm. Where uh, do you see it going in the next uh, 50? I don't know. If you if you'd <laughs> ask, hey, hey, if you'd asked me that uh, f- five years ago, I wouldn't – I couldn't. I, I I would never have dreamed that I could lower my trolling motor and point my trolling motor right out there and see a drop off and see fish on it and be able to throw at those fish and, and actually catch them mm-hmm. and see them and know how far they are out in front of me. Mm-hmm. But I have I have the capabilities of doing that now, uh, or being able to pull up thirty feet deep and say, "Ooh, look right there," and drop it straight down and drop shot and catch fish directly under the boat. Mm-hmm. I didn't think I could do that uh, uh, ten years ago. Right. I didn't think that I could pick up a fishing rod that would weigh less than three ounces and catch a thirty-pound fish on it. Mm-hmm. But I can. Yep. Uh, I've seen you do it. <laughs> I have. I, I, and yeah. I've seen Rich do it. Yep. I've, I've seen you and Rich do it uh, to take a to take a, a lightweight rod that weighs practically nothing and just lightweight line and catch tremendously big fish where we think, used to think you needed 
right 40 pound test line and a big heavy stiff no, uh, we see 30, that we see that class especially line. especially in something like tarpon fishing or or marlin fishing or sailfish you know where the sailfish rig used to be huge yeah now it's it looks like that i mean seriously oh, yeah, it looks that, you're right about like that you're right and um do you think that more people or less people are involved in fishing these days i see it i, I look at the data and I, let me tell you what the way I see it, the way I see it. I see it surge one year, and I see mm-hmm. it a little bit slow, and mm-hmm. then I see it surge again, mm-hmm. I see it a little bit slow. I look at hunting. Hunting is an expensive sport. Mm-hmm. It's very expensive. And I hear hunters say, I just can't afford it. And they're picking up fishing again. Mm. And it's harder and harder to find a place to hunt. Mm-hmm. Because I look at it right here in, in the Mid-South, where I live. Uh, I know a lot of duck hunters. Unless you've got a lot of money, mm-hmm. uh, duck hunting is an expensive sport. It's a seasonal sport. you got three months of the year. All right, your equipment, your dog, and unless you belong to a club, mm-hmm. it's hard to find a place. Even right here on the Mississippi River, you know. Everything has to be just perfect. Right. Uh, fishing, you can fish 12 months of the year. With interstate travel the way it is, uh, there's more and more f- uh, availability. Right. Uh, and I hear a lot of people say, I'd rather spend my time fishing. Yeah. Uh, I can fish 12 months of the year. I'd rather spend my allotted time fishing as I had Mm-hmm. I've got X amount of time. I've got X amount of dollars. And I would rather spend that fishing yeah, as, I had, as I had uh, three months of the year spending that same amount of money hunting. Yeah, certainly a lot of people <clears throat> do that. I, I, I saw for a while that it looked like the young people were abandoning the sport or not being introduced to the sport. I guess not abandoning it. They were never introduced to the sport. But now I see this resurgence of these young young kids getting involved, and it seems like it's more popular than ever for the young kids. And you see it on YouTube, and there's th- hundreds, thousands of these YouTube channels where they're kids pond hopping and catching bass and brim, peacock bass and all the South Florida things. Um, it seems like it's more popular. Well, Leslie, well, it, it, it's growing. Leslie, who does our Facebook, mm-hmm. uh, does our social media stuff, she said that she has sees a surge in uh, an age group of uh, twenty-five to forty. That age group mm-hmm. is 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 getting into fishing big yeah. time. Yeah. In well, tw- that's good. That's good. All right. So before we wrap this up, I want to know if you um, if you could give your twenty-five year old self some advice what might that be if i could give myself advice when you were 25 you step back in time and you meet 25 year old bill dance what would you tell him Ooh, <laughs> i love you because you give you like you get some of the craziest toughest answers yeah if i was 25 years old what would i do now, what would you tell yourself with all your experience that you've gained right now, knowing what you know now, you step back in time, and you see Bill Dance at 25 years old, what would you tell him? Oof. I don't know what I'd tell me. I'd have to think about it. I think I would change knowing I'd have to go forward and then, and then come back. I think... Uh, I think there'd be a lot of things I would change. I, a lot of things I wouldn't do that I did. Well, you've been in for. <laughs> I'm just waiting. I'm waiting. I never That's know what's. A, I never I know, know what's. I know, know you got out. people probably looking and saying, "What would I be doing? What would I do?" Uh, I don't know if I would. Uh, you know. You know, my life's been good to me. Life's been real good to me. I was able to do what I wanted to do to change a hobby into a profession. Mm-hmm. And it's it hadn't all been uh, peaches and cream. Mm-hmm. It's been, I've, I've hit some uh, 
big rocks. It hadn't been all gravel. Mm -hmm. I've hit some big rocks along the way. Uh, I've stumped my toes. But I, I would have made some, some, some changes along the way. You know, I wish I hadn't have done this or I wish I hadn't have done that, but it's just my, there had been some changes. Uh, I wish I had invested in that stock, <laughs> a, 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 you know, a little bit stronger. Mm -hmm. But those were just things that – but overall, uh, I've been pretty much content. I married the girl I, that I wanted to marry. The – the children that are married, I mean, uh, that, that, that that Diane and I have had, uh, uh, they've been good. They, by and large, have been, we hadn't had any major problems with them. Mm -hmm. uh, they've all served their time in prison. And they, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they've, they, we hadn't had any trouble with them. Uh -huh. they, they've gotten an education. They've done well. And, uh. She's been proud of them. Uh, I don't know. I, well, that's a one. If, if I had to give it up tomorrow, I'd, I'd be fairly pleased with uh, with 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 my life. Well, I think that's a life well lived. Uh, if you can look, I, I think back that's and, a good. I think it's just a good definition. Yeah. I, I, I'm pretty much pleased with a life well lived. Yeah. Well, you got no regrets. I mean, uh, somebody that that. Man, I wish I had. I wish I had just given it a try. I thought I could make that happen, and and I wish I could have just given it a try. You know, you you can always you can always wish, but uh, you know you can always wish it was better. But it could have always been worse. Mm -hmm. But uh, but the point is, is that I think people with a lot of regrets are people that thought they could make something happen, but then they didn't actually ever give it a try. And then they get then then forty years later they're thinking, man, I wish I had done that, you know. And you don't have any of that. That's that's a life any. that's I, a I, life I, well lived. I I've, think I've had a life well lived. I, yeah. I really believe that because I've got a I've got a good wife. She's she, she sacrificed a lot, and she's uh, uh, I've got uh, a, I've got a good business. Uh, I've got good good people that uh, I work with, uh, that work with me, and I work with them. Uh, I mean, I've 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 got a good I've I, you know, oh, you could always say I wish I'd have made a, a ten million dollars more, but I don't want to be selfish about it. I've I've, I've I've had a good life. Yeah, I really have. Well, <clears throat> that. Uh I, I have been witness to to your life on the sidelines, watching from TV. My dad and I used to watch your show when I grew up, and used to. <clears throat> I, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I still watch it. I watch I watch your show with my kids, but uh, I just want to I just want to honor you, um, and thank you for sitting down with us no, today. Thank you, Tom. And uh, I just want to tell you that I have tremendous respect for you. Well, thank you, buddy. Tremendous respect. And thank one you, of the buddy. reasons why I have tremendous respect for you is because from the moment I first met you as as someone coming into your industry, a potential threat, maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm giving myself way too much credit there. But you, no. you, you look and you see people coming in, and you were never anything but unbelievably welcoming, unbelievably helpful, thank and you. encouraging. Thank you. And you don't have to be that way. But a lot of people aren't that way. And I'd like to honor you for that and thank you for that. And then just also um, just thank you for, for what you've done for our industry. It's, it's well, thank amazing. You. Thank and you. Uh, you have brought so many people into this sport and helped them along the way and helped so much of this industry innovate thank you like you wouldn't have the innovations in the outboard motors if there wasn't the opportunity to sell those outboard motors so you created a a a model not only for you to make money and to continue to do what you like to do but for all of this stuff that's surrounding us uh, a, an opportunity to sell it 
an opportunity for a company like Bass Pro Shops to get started and move on, an opportunity for Walmart, an opportunity for all of these different things. You created that, and uh, I've been fortunate enough just to just to kind of be strolling along in the in the shadow. You paved the road, and, and we're just thank walking you, along behind it. But I want to thank you. Thank you, And uh, I, I value you as a friend and a mentor. Well, thank you're you. You're a good buddy of mine. You and Rich are two of my favorites and always have been. Well, thank, thank you, partner. You. I All appreciate right, and honored to do this with you. Thank you, partner. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Bill Dance. We're going to share some of my favorite ones over the next couple of weeks. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the comments below or you can text me directly 305-930-7346. That's it. We'll see you next week.